Hello everyone, it is the 6th of October 2020 and I'm really excited about this guest. It's, it's Sue Cook from, she's living in North Oxfordshire now, Sue is now 71. She's a writer and broadcaster and everyone's going to recognise you Sue. In fact I spoke to you on the phone yesterday and as soon as I heard your voice it was like I went back in time. And it was warming and it was comforting and it was a voice I trusted, it's a very powerful voice and it's a voice that a lot of people uh, my age, I was born in 1976, will really remember um, so, so well. But before we start the interview, I just want to um, play a couple of clips. One is your very last Crime Watch UK from 19, June 1995. And there's another clip here from Children in Need in 1984. When we've had a look at those, we'll come back and do the interview. Well now here again is Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Haynes with a second file of photocall before that time, wasn't it? That was the day before Good Friday. That was a sighting by someone who knows Natalie well and we're quite satisfied that that was the time and day. Well there'll be more to report when the programme comes back in September of course after the summer break. As Crime Watch UK enters incredibly its 12th year, it's goodbye from me to the series as I'm moving on to other things. The programme will continue to go from strength to strength of course but on my own behalf I'd like to say thank you very much for your support over the years. It is to your credit that the programme succeeded in solving so many serious crimes. So have a good summer and see you soon. Don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night and goodbye. Now, the start of our special evening on BBC One with this year's appeal for children in need. Radio Shetland calling children in need. Radio Cambridge calling children in need. This is BBC, BBC Radio, 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 Radio BBC Leeds calling Radio children in need. This is Radio Shetland calling children in need. This is Radio Radio Stoke calling children in need. BBC Glass calling children in need. This is Radio Glass calling children in need. BBC Radio Glass calling children in need. BBC Glass calling children in need. BBC Glass calling children in need. BBC Glass calling children in need. Last year, a generous public gave over a million pounds to the BBC Children in Need appeal. It's £70 here in Television Centre, by threats and bullying, of course, but £70 in the well-done the wardrobe department. You, you have a little tale, haven't you? Well, my Auntie Alwyn rang me last night, you oh, see. I'm man. half Welsh, and my Auntie Alwyn rang me last night. <laughs> and she and her friend Cathy have been selling these little crocheted um, place mats and things mm. like that, and cuddly toys, and they've raised £45. So the Welsh aren't so bad. Bully if you're Auntie Alwyn. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the Welsh, they've just got short legs. <laughs> Well, that's as maybe. Okay, anyway, I'm going to be bringing you news of how the appeal's doing in radio and television stations throughout the country. We've got outside broadcast cameras dotted around the place, including Corley service station on the M6. So even if you're on the road, you can't escape. We hope to reach you with tonight's appeal. <laughs> well, I have to say, I could have watched those all day. And, uh, you know, the, the quality's not fantastic, obviously, because they were filmed a long time ago. But... Uh, I mean, you must still be recognised, Sue, and it's just wonderful um, to speak to somebody that's a part of the BBC of old, maybe, that so it's, it was a different, it was a different feel back then, I think. And I, I was very, very proud to work for the BBC, I have to say, when I got a job with them in sort of 2008, 2009 as a presenter. But um, unfortunately, now I wouldn't work for the BBC. Um, and, I, and I know a lot of people who work within the BBC who feel, they don't feel so much pride at the moment. Um, they probably feel quite a lot of shame um, and we're going to be talking about a lot of things, but, uh, you know, we connected on Twitter. This is why I always introduce people. Why, why am I talking to Sue Cook right now? It's because I saw your feed on Twitter and I saw this is a woman who's concerned. Um, this is a woman who's concerned by the lack of balance coming from the BBC in a counter narrative that, um, there's lots of issues that you felt I could see weren't being reported properly. And also an empath, somebody who cared. I can see you're a very compassionate person. So Sue, f first of all, thank you very much for coming to talk to me. Um, well, I'll ask you, you agreed to this interview, why? What, did you want, what message did you want to, to put across? Well, yes, things have changed a lot in, since, since the days I worked for the BBC. We were much, I think we were much more investigative, whether it's to do with money or some kind of ethos coming from above. I actually don't know, but um, we would have been straight down to investigating all sorts of things. We'd have been, we, we don't take anything on trust. 
you wonder why um, these PCR tests are, um, so many people are saying they're flawed. You'd look at them, you'd look at the way they're run, you'd look at the way they're funded, you'd be a bit shocked to find that they're not NHS tests at all, they're, it's privatised. So who is Serco, what, you know, what, and what's in it? Who's, who's, who makes up Serco, this company that runs the tests? Why are they flawed? Who is saying they're flawed? And in what way are they flawed? And how might that skew the results? That's one investigation. I'd like to investigate um, who SAGE are, who's on SAGE, you know, who are these people? Uh, I gather they chop and change. It's not the same people on the committee all the time. So I'd like to know who they are. Um, PHE, what, what is PHE? You know, who's on that and how is that funded? And I thought the government had announced that they weren't going to be talking to PHE anymore, but Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance are up there on the press conferences, so presumably they are still talking to PHE, but that's, that's the sort of thing that I'd like to investigate. I'd like to look into all the figures. Um, I'd like to investigate um, the legalities of everything. I did present a programme called Out of Court for BBC Two for five years, and we'd have been all over the legalities of um, these restrictions that are being imposed on people, the lockdowns, the... Um, the fines of £4,000, which are the untenable amount of money to fine people. Um, the lack of democracy, you know, how can, how can these things be the law when there's been no democratic way of, of ratifying them? All the people who represent us, the MPs, what do our MPs think? I mean, I'd like to go out and, and talk to the MPs and find out what, what they think, get them on, but you don't see them platformed. I think that's another thing that annoys me about the BBC is the people they choose to platform and the people they don't. So I've seen on Twitter and on various other media some really interesting people like Professor Carol Sikora, Carl Kennedon, Ken Hennigan, um, uh, Ivor Cummins, all kinds of very interesting, Mike Yeadon, Michael Levitt. But all you see, you know, you see for some inexplicable reason, you see Neil Ferguson, all the time, you see Neil Ferguson being wheeled out. What a discredited, you know, what a, what a load of things he's got wrong in the past. But I would like to see some other people, other voices. And the other person they wheel out all the time is Devi Sridhar, who just negates everything and, and fear mongers and doom mongers. And uh, so I don't know, I just, I feel there isn't enough um, balance. That's, and, and I don't want to um, give my opinions on things. That's not, a BBC journalist's job at all. The job is to give everything a fair hearing and let people make their own minds up with using the facts uh, uh, in front of them. Well, that's certainly what I hope to do on this channel is to interview people like you um, with a focus on the media to allow people to decide for themselves what to do for their families and for their friends and for their future and for their health. And, and the media plays such a huge, huge role you know, your voice, like I said, it's powerful, it's trusted, it's BBC of old, it's old school BBC. I Honestly, watching Children in Need and Crime Watch UK, and you, you know, you can't underestimate the power of someone like you've got, you has, you've got to, because, you know, when I was a little girl in the sort of 80s and 90s, and, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of television, we certainly didn't have these. We had the, the TV in the living room, and somebody like you, you were on these, you know, on the primetime BBC One shows, important shows as well, such as Children in Need and Crime Watch, and you said you're on Channel 4 as well. And it was almost like you were in the room with my family. It was almost like an auntie that came around every Sunday for a cup of tea. I, I, honestly, that's what you're like. And your face and your voice, it has that association for me. It's like a, a member of the family. That is what the BBC has been for generations, certainly for my mother. Um... She loves the BBC and I, you know, I can tell her how we put the news together and I can tell her it comes from a press release and it's corporate and government um, led narrative a lot of the time because money does control the narrative and still my mum will listen to the BBC and in a time of crisis we need somewhere to go and we need trusted media sources and you are trusted I think. Or have you had a lot of people come to you? Do you have conversations with former colleagues at the BBC? Are people coming to you right now? So and Sue, what do I do? I used to trust the BBC six months ago and now I'm in a panic. They're scaring me. They're not listening to scientists like Professor Sunita Gutcha. Um, and, it, and I'll talk in a minute about the great Barrington Declaration and the three uh, professors in epidemiology that met from Oxford, Stanford and Harvard. No sign of it on the news today. Uh, are people coming to you saying, Sue, what's going on? 
a lot, yes. Everybody I talk to, I'm, whenever I have any phone call I have, conversation will always turn to the media and people will be saying, what is the matter with the media these days? It's so scary. I can't, loads of people I know say they don't watch it anymore. They don't watch mainstream media at all. Loads of people say that, which is a real worry because, you know, we, how are you going to get your facts? How are you going to know what's going on if you're not watching anything at all? Um, everyone from the butcher to, you know, somebody else walk, walking their dog and walking possibly in the street will all say, what on earth is going on with the media? And I have to say, I, like you, I felt it was such a privilege to work for the BBC when I first started working for them back in the 70s. Um, I was just knocked out by how wonderful it was to be working for the BBC. And it's, I've been so loyal to them for, for years and years, but the last couple of months um, is really, I'm afraid, disillusioned me terribly. And I've actually stopped listening to the Today programme for the first time in about 20 years. I've now listened to talk radio because I, I get my, my concerns addressed on talk radio. I don't hear people being insulted and interrupted and talked over uh, as though they do, I'm afraid, on the Today programme. That's really sad. It's really sad, Sue. And you know, from both of us having worked for the BBC and being so, I, I mean, I can't tell you how excited I was. I couldn't believe it. I had to pinch myself for days. I couldn't believe I got a job at the BBC. And now I would not take a job at the BBC. I would be ashamed to take a job at the BBC. And I know that people who work there have been have been getting a lot of abuse, which I completely find absolutely abhorrent, any type of abuse. But, but those people at the BBC that are trying to reform from within, that are frustrated at the moment, I don't think they realise how important trust is to their brands and it's mm. being eroded. So that if they don't do, get that reform from within, there will be no future. You know, if you don't listen to the public, if you don't investigate, um, you'd lose trust. And I did an interview with a data journalist called Connor Ibbotson and he um, had done a survey looking at trust towards the BBC over the last sort of 20 years. And it was... Do you trust a BBC journalist to tell the truth? And it was sort of 70 or 80% said yes in the early 2000s. And then there was a, a, it's been a gradual decline and it's sort of around 50% now with a big dip around the Jimmy Savile affair. Yeah. Um, so that was really interesting to hear what you're saying that you used to listen to BBC Radio, you know, the Radio 4 Today programme and it's only recently you've switched off. And it, what's going on, Sue? What's going on? Are they, are they really just having to stick to the government line? Well, this is the question. Why are they doing this? It, I cannot work it out. I can only think, I suppose if you are working for the BBC, you've got to be careful. You can't um, frighten people too much. You can't go against the government line too much, I suppose, because it's important that everybody, if, if the government has taken a line, it's not going to work if um, people are carping against it in a way. Um, so we had, I mean, certainly when the lockdown happened, I think all of us were quite prepared to go along with that and give it a chance. It was 12 weeks and we could see what the point was. We could see that we were going to flatten the um, curve, you know, squash the Mexican hat, and we were going to stop the NHS being overwhelmed. And we'd seen pictures on the media of coffins being loaded into lorries in Italy and taken out and oh, crikey, you know, the Black Death is coming. Um, but then quite plainly, uh, even though this wasn't repeated, uh, reported on the media, I, the NHS wasn't overwhelmed by any means. People I know who work in the NHS were going home at lunchtime because those, the hospitals were empty. All the operations had been cancelled. There was nothing for them to do. And they were feeling really guilty because people were banging saucepans on Thursday night saying how wonderful the NHS was. And they were feeling, we're not wonderful at all. We're not doing anything. We're going home at lunchtime and watching the telly and putting our pajamas on. So, it's an honesty um, and a bravery so it is coming from some professionals, isn't it? They are coming out and saying, like the senior di dialysis nurse from South Wales, who's on the New Opinions channel that was launched yesterday, she said exactly like you did. You know, we, we, weren't, we, we were being misrepresented by the, the media, really, and we weren't busy. And uh, we feel we've let the public down because we think people are suffering. I mean, that was her message. There's greater suffering at the moment from missed, you know, cancer treatments, mental health, suicide, businesses, poverty, children... The list goes on and on and on. And for me as a journalist, I've always wondered, why is the agenda not suffering first? You know, I look at very closely at the headlines. You know, I was watching the BBC One O'Clock News today as I was going to talk to you about it. And I was just thinking to myself, they did mention, you know, the Church of England have put its reputation ahead of the fate of its victims of children and child sexual abuse. Have you heard about that story today? 
I hadn't actually, no. I did see that they ran that funeral story, that appalling story with the, with the funeral where the two sons moved their chairs to be next to their mother and this bully walked down the, the aisle and, told, and stopped the, the ceremony and told them to separate again, which I thought was appalling. Did, did and we don't see many stories about people being affected like that on the mainstream media, so I was very pleased to see that they were reporting that. Yeah, that was good, wasn't it? Um, but there was a story about, you know, the Church of England have put its reputation ahead of the fate of victims in child sexual abuse cases. And also that came up in March with the, uh, it is the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, but it wasn't a headline. And I know the BBC, and we've listened to a, a clip of you talking about, um, well, we should, we've watched a clip of BBC's Children in Need. Um, I think if the BBC really wanted to, to look after children, they need to focus on children more in their news agenda. Um, and there really wasn't a huge mention of that, the Church of England doing that. And, and also, um, you know, there's been a lot that come out from the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse that I've seen uh, police officers, senior police officers on oath testify that they had to cover up for VIP paedophiles. Don't see that on the BBC. Um, and I find that there was an irony there, especially when I looked at that, you know, the children in need um, video that from 1984. But, but what's the agenda? How do they choose the agenda? This is what I want to ask you. Um, how do they choose what the headline news is? And why are they following a certain line with Trump? Why are they following a certain line with Boris? How does it all work? Can you explain to the public because so they can understand? I can't. I wish if I were there now, maybe I would be able to, but I really can only tell you that if I were there in the days, if, it, if, if this was 20 years ago, um, things would be very, very different. I think one of the problems is we, we, we've got too much technology now. So these tests, you know, we're, we're seeing, uh, you know, 40,000 cases or whatever the numbers are, the, all these cases, but they're not actually illnesses. But I think that this test, these, these tests are actually, it's only my opinion and what do I know? I'm not an expert, but I would like to see these tests uh, ditched. I'd like to abandon the tests except for people in, in um, you know, health professions and, and um, care homes and so on. But this mass testing, I think, is skewing our view of what's really happening. You look at the curve. It was the, the classic Gompertz curve. It's, it peaked back in March, April. It's now it's crawling along the floor. And these tests, the, the, you know, these results are just completely at odds with the actual realities of the hospitalizations and the deaths. And surely those are the figures that should count. But even the deaths, you know, the media will say, and there's been another rise in the deaths today with this kind of terribly concerned tone. It, deaths have doubled. And you think, well, what does that mean? Has it gone up from four to eight or has it gone up to from six million to 12 million? What does it double? Doesn't mean anything. And a lot of use of percentages and, and things. But that doesn't answer your problem, your, your question. I actually don't know what the agenda is. I always wonder whether... Fear? You said fear to me. You said you didn't like the language. The is the agenda fear? You, you said um, they use words like, verbs like surge and soar. What's mm. the, is the agenda to, to scare people? I wonder whether that's to create a dependency on the media to make people watch more, to see what's happening next and how, you know, how their lives are going to be affected. But I wonder whether there's even been some um, meeting that we don't know about at, at Downing Street where they've been told, you know, it's really important for you to go along with the with the, the national line, the government policy on this, and please don't undermine it. But I, I really do not know. Well, I, I, I can understand. I, I, I hope my mum's watching, OK? Because you have a, um, a lot of the public trust you, Sue. And to, to hear you say that what you have said about the BBC, I think is quite, well, I think is very important. But where do they go? Where do they go if they're, if they're confused? I mean, I, would, I, I, I cannot share enough, and I'm going to keep mentioning, please, please have a look at the, at the Great Barrington Declaration. And I'm going to mention this, too because it's so important, and it's not on the headline news, but at least I have a YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook following now, and I can... I can push the story. It could be my headline. So Bruce Media, it's our headline. Herd immunity, age-targeted strategy. Infectious disease epidemiologists and public health scientists have got together. They've all signed this Great Barrington Declaration. It's on Unheard as well, the video. Dr. Martin Caldor from Harvard, who I interviewed on the channel. Dr. Sunitra Gupta from Oxford, who I haven't interviewed yet. And Dr. Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford. And, and they, the co-signers, are just unbelievable professors and doctors in this area of expertise, which say we should have, we should have protected the vulnerable and built up herd immunity in the low-risk 
age categories to protect those vulnerable people. Um, and it's a strategy they've been trying to get out. And I know Professor Sunitra Gupta has been on um, BBC Question Time. And, you know, I have seen a little bit more. And Carl Hennigan, I think, has been on Sky and ITV as well. There have been, they've been in on these publications, haven't they? But not necessarily as headline news. So what do people do then? Uh, so where do they go for their information? What can they trust? So just going back to your Barrington Declaration, I think um, one thing I think is really interesting and really needs a proper investigation is this whole concept of herd immunity, which is almost like a dirty word, isn't it? Or community immunity. It's, it, there's nothing wrong with that. Remember the doctor, when you used to go to the doctor feeling a bit under the weather and the doctor would say, you've got a virus, sorry, there's nothing you can do about it. Just go away and the virus will take its course. And that's how we're all still here and breathing today is because we've got... Uh, we've built up over the centuries our kind of mass immunity to things and we do it by some people getting ill and some people not getting ill um, and I was really interested that that's what the Barrington Declaration is very much about isn't it the strategy to to um, go to a large extent with herd immunity and, and protect the vulnerable um, not not um, trying to lock the vulnerable down or make them do anything they don't want to do but just just to do be considerate of them and make sure that they they have a choice about what they do and they're aware of their choices so um, as I say that's just another investigation I'd really love to have seen on the BBC and I think there are a lot of people within the BBC I don't want to slag off the BBC at all because in a way because there are a lot of people in there who mean really well and, and are trying very hard from within to change things it just seems to be some rather strange overall policy that maybe it's just something that, that's just accepted and they haven't discussed it properly I, I, I don't know that, that, because I'm not there anymore but um, uh, that's, I just wanted to say that I know there are a lot of people there who, who mean really well and are trying very hard from inside they are trying very hard um, they are and it's very very difficult because um, I speak to them there's a couple of people within the BBC that I speak to um, and if they ever want to come out in the future and say what's really been going on but do you think we're going to look back in history and be on the right side of history, Sue, or um, what do you think? I mean, it's it, there is no doubt COVID exists um, and long COVID exists and people are still suffering from COVID that, was, that have had it. But the for, for me, it's very, very clear that you either have herd immunity through vaccination or you have herd immunity through through building it up through infection from the from the community, from the younger members of community who very, very low risk of, of death or serious implications, incredibly low. And, you know, even on the Great Barrington Declaration, they've said children are more at risk of, of, of influenza um, mm. than COVID. So it is real. But that's, so that didn't, that, that message hasn't been getting through through the media and um, certain doctors haven't been allowed to, 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 to debate even, not even, you know, to come on and debate with other scientists. It must be very awkward and you know, actually quite embarrassing for some journalists that this is taking place. So where do we go for our news? What, what do we trust for our families, Sue? Uh, well, I don't know, things like the Unheard channel on YouTube is very good. Um, uh, talk radio, as I said, I, I listen to now. Um, just, just uh, oh, there's lockdown TV as well. That's a good one. Um, there's spiked. There's, uh, I think you just have to, I think young people do this anyway. They trawl through and they, they find where they want to go. It's the, it's the older people. My mother, what, like your mother, she watches the BBC and I, was, I phone her every night. She's 101 now. I phone her every night and she says, oh, it's terrible, isn't it? The news is just awful. There's so many people now getting this terrible disease. And I said, look, that's the cases, that's the infection, that's positive test results, that's not people who are dying or even getting terribly ill. She, oh, right, okay. But every night I have to remind her because she's getting this message from the mainstream media and she wouldn't dream of watch, of um, you know, trawling through YouTube or, or uh, looking online for her news. It's, it's those older people who, who uh, still trust the BBC. I agree with you. And is it better to, to work with the BBC at the moment than to look at maybe some global media brands such as Google and Facebook and Twitter? I was looking at the monthly active users for Google and Facebook. It's around sort of different figures. I'm, I'm seeing around two and a half billion. Um, Twitter, 330 million. These are global media brands and, and, and people are a bit scared about our global, global governance. Mm. Our media is very closely connected to, to government. Um, 
these big, big platforms, and we've seen some issues with censorship as well with Google and Facebook. And I, right from the beginning of lockdown, so I was sharing ACU 2020, the German doctors. Um, I don't know if even by saying this, I will be allowed to upload this now to YouTube. But the censorship issues on these really massive global media platforms are very scary. Um, do you know much about that? Have you? Um, I don't. I wouldn't. I'd be very wary uh, of trusting everything I see on social media. Um, I think the only advice you can you can have is question everything, look at everything, find out as much as you can from all sorts of different platforms, and just try and use your common sense and see which rings true and which doesn't. Don't take anything on trust without backing it up with from another source. I know that sometimes you can read an article that does seem more balanced. Um, but often it's, it's, it's posted at one in the morning and it's just an article. I mean, it's what's headline news or what's a campaign is very different, isn't it? I mean, um, we're only talking about this now because it's, it's on the media all the time, isn't it? I mean, that's the only reason we're even having this discussion because the coronavirus anything. campaign is pretty overwhelming. It's everywhere, every day and has been for six months. What's going on in Yemen? What's going on in Syria? What's going on in, in, in India? What's going on in the rest of the world? All we hear is COVID, COVID, COVID. It's worse than Brexit. We've got nothing but COVID. And we're so parochial, really. Um, we don't even really look at, on the, on the mainstream media, we don't look at what's happening in France or Spain or other, other European countries. Uh, I think it would be very interesting to have a roundup of how things are going in other countries because they're just as mad i mean the, the whole world seems nuts it's not just the, the uk I, w I want to also go back to something that you mentioned here um so you you wrote a list of some of the things the omission of any religious perspective as well you've you've put what, what would you want to say about that well, I don't think the church has covered itself in glory in all this. I mean, where have they been? They haven't come out and said anything. Whether that's because they haven't been asked by the mainstream media to make any comments, um, I don't know. But I think the church's being closed is tragic. I mean, for, not many people go to church these days, I don't think anyway. So I don't think social distancing in a church would be that problematic. So to, sh to shut the churches, I think, has been dreadful. There are lots of scandals I'd like to see more about, like the maternity wards and people, um, pregnant women not allowed to bring their partner to scans. And I think there are in some places, many places, the, the partner either isn't allowed in the labour ward at all or is only allowed for three hours. I mean, how ridiculous is and difficult is that and heartbreaking? I just think there, there is just so many scandals I'd like to see investigated. I'd like to see a proper investigation into the vaccination thing because everybody's putting everything on vaccination and track and trace to be our exit from all this sort of nightmare. But I don't think either of them are going to be the answer. The answer is, in my view, herd immunity. But I'd like to know about the vaccinations. Who are the companies who are, who are putting this vaccination together? Who's, what sh who's got shares in them? Um, will they be mandatory when they finally get one? And if they're not mandatory, maybe there'll be something else like a mandatory certificate if you're going to be, have the freedom of, to, get, to get around freedom of movement. Maybe you'll have to have some kind of certificate that proves you've been vaccinated. But I'd like a proper investigation into that. And because otherwise, the vaccination is going to suddenly be with us and then we're going to be taken by surprise about how to manage it. There are lots of questions there and, and a lot of uncertainty for the future for people, I agree, in the, the mandatory vaccination um, situation. And so if you were head of the newsroom, so would, what, would your, what would you lead on? Would you lead on the, that, that that causes the most suffering or that that gives the greatest impact or that, that you know, how, how would you choose what to lead on? What agenda would you choose at the moment? You just lead on whatever the um, selection of stories were available on that particular day. So um, I don't know. I suppose today, obviously, people are leading on Trump because he came out of hospital. I think if, if I see one more shot of him coming out of those doors and getting into his helicopter, I think I'll throw, the, throw a brick at the telly. But... Um, I don't know. I mean, as a news editor, you would, I, but I, I'm sure I would choose a, a very different running order from what's what tends to be chosen now. It's interesting, isn't it? And I, I just think, as you, you mentioned, the language thing, I would 
try not to have this awful voice of doom and these emotive words like the figures surged and the, or the figures soared or Boris Johnson says we mustn't throw in the sponge or we mustn't let the virus let, let it rip. All these kind of emotive language. I would try and be much more factual and I would try and be much more questioning and I would have more, a, more, a wider variety of people to interview about things. Very fair points. And um, before we finish the interview, what's your message to people who work at the BBC right now? Keep on questioning. Just, just question. There are so many things to question. So many things we need to see questioned, and then we're not seeing them. And that it's, it's vital. It's a matter of life and death, and we shouldn't be taking everything on trust because people's lives are being so badly affected. I would like to see more questioning, more rigour. And where can people follow you and, and find out a little bit more about your work? And I know you've been writing. Um, is it best to follow you on Twitter or your website? Um, probably best on Twitter. I'm not very good at keeping my website updated. Uh, I suppose Twitter is probably the best place. I'm Sue Cook and the O's are zeros of Cook. Fantastic. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we end the interview? You know, I've mentioned vaccinations and the legalities of things. Care homes are like a proper investigation of care homes and what actually goes on. A lot of them, are, the government got the blame for a lot of the problems in care homes, but actually most of them are privately owned. So the private ownership needs a bit of looking into. Um, uh, I Things like um, a lot of people, things that people are suffering with now, like um, not being able to, if you've got a friend or a relative who's, in hospital, ill, possibly dying, you're not allowed to visit. I think I'd just break the door down if it was, down if it was me, but I, I know of a couple of cases where people are in hospital now, and um, in one case, their daughter, and in another case, the husband, the wife, isn't allowed to go in and see them. I've got another friend whose mother's in a care home, and she hasn't seen her for months. She does little sort of, um, she's taught the, her mother how to, um, use an iPad and so she can but but to, to have not seen your mother your elderly mother for, for for about two months I think is is really terrible my mother's 101 and I just decided I'm going to visit her no matter what if I get stopped by the police I don't care you know she's only she who knows how much time she has left and I'm not going to have her sitting at home on her own without anybody to visit I'm just it's just not humane no it's not humane it's um yeah, and, and, a, and a reminder to, to journalists, like you said, so, you know, question. And if you can't do what you need to do as journalists within the organisations you work for, find another way. You know, there must be another way. I mean, I'm lucky that I've built up my own independent platforms and no one's telling me what to do. And I can do it. I'm very lucky to be in that position. And I know not everyone is. And I know it's very, very difficult. Um, but I think that, that they can push from within, can't they? I think maybe get together within the BBC, a group of journalists who feel this way. Um, I think it's going to happen. I have a feeling that it's happening. I think that there is a shift going on. I think people are beginning to understand that humanity isn't coming first at the moment. It's, it's getting relegated. And it's, um, I think humanity has got to be put back at the top of all the agenda for everything. Well, thank you for your humanity. Um, for doing this uh, interview and, and sharing your thoughts and feelings, because I know it's, it can be a difficult place to be. There, are, there can be abuse on, on Twitter and other social media if you take a particular line, although I haven't had it, to be honest with you. I've, I've only had incredible support, um, but I know you have, you've been courageous and you've been compassionate in coming and speaking to us, Sue, and, um, and I can't thank you enough. And Sue, so, uh, so. I hope it's made sense because when you when you feel emotional about something, sometimes you don't make enough sense. But I hope it's been. I agree. Yeah. It's it's difficult sometimes, especially you know if you're a mum and you're um and you're you care about people, and I do, and I see so so much suffering. I know there is suffering with coronavirus as well, but there's so much, like you say, so much um, so much suffering outside of that towards these restrictions and lockdown measures and um it's uh, it's getting quite difficult for people i think and it's important the voices like yours that are trusted um come out and, and and speak for those people and you've done that today so thank you very much um yeah we wish you all the best to so stay in touch thanks